Dr. Anthony Cave. You're a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist here to talk about something fascinating and that's the limbic system, dopamine, overstimulation, and how it all comes together in surgery. This is a real operating room. Here's the table. Here's the life support machines behind me. And yes, real anesthetics. And we're going to talk about just how much dopamine and trauma come up, not only in medical trauma, but help keep us in cycles, vicious cycles, if you will, of not being able to heal from physical and psychological traumas. How can you break them? Well, the answer lies partly from how anesthetics work, in particular, anesthetics that have psychedelic-like properties. I see Heidi coming in, Shani, uh, Chris, everyone. Good to see you all on here. So what does the operating room and surgery have to do with dopamine and overstimulation and trauma? Well, when you're in this room, we know that you're literally having a major physical and psychological trauma because you're on a table and your body's being cut open. So that releases a whole cascade of inflammatory markers as your body tries to heal. We know that all of the anesthetic medications, well, I shouldn't say all of them, but this one here is fentanyl. This one directly stimulates dopamine receptors. That's why we have an opioid epidemic. Uh, oh, by the way, Warren, good to see you. And Iris, good to see you. Ursuline. Get to see you too. Midazolam is a benzodiazepine also. These all have strong addictive properties and that's why the dopamine agonism is very real here in the operating room under anesthesia. Otherwise, the limbic system. Remember, the limbic system involves parts of the brain that we believe are heavily involved with emotion and behavior. So many parts of the brain contribute to the limbic system. We'll focus on the amygdala specifically. It's an almond-shaped part of the brain. And we know that anesthetic medications and psychedelics in particular affect the amygdala. We know that just the fear of surgery itself can be tremendous or one in four patients, one in five patients might postpone their surgery <laughs> out of fear of the general anesthesia alone, whether it's anesthesia gas or breathing tubes or even liquid general anesthesia like propofol or ketamine. So clearly there's a lot of limbic system activity going on and the dopamine and the uh, trauma. So we won't talk about anesthetics because let's face it, you're not going to be using <laughs> these outside the operating room and there are ways to heal even without having surgery and that's what psychedelic experiences can help some patients with in closely medically supervised settings. Personally, I use IV ketamine for that reason, but similar um, concepts apply to different psychedelics as well. So remember that first and foremost, when someone's coming to me for surgery, for ketamine, the limbic system is usually very, very wound up. When we have early stressors as a child, adverse childhood experiences or any other type of traumatic experience. This winds up the parts of our brain that regulate our emotions and our behaviors later in life. The more wound up they are from early traumas, not just sexual traumas or physical traumas, but even seeing traumas in other people can cause unregulated anxiety, major depression, PTSD, etc., which unmasks, as you know, under anesthesia and can be worsened, what we might call medical trauma, or can be healed, like a healing experience. Remember, when someone comes in the OR with me, I don't want to just fix their body. I want to try to heal their mind as much as possible, and at the very least, not fix the body and break the mind in the process. So a really good question here from Michaela. What do you do when someone is having a bad trip? Michaela, this is so important to any psychedelic journey, and the number one thing to do is to prevent it from happening. That's why I talk with patients very carefully as we prepare for anesthesia or any other type of psychedelic experience. Number two is to have the trust, which is what all the empathogens also help foster, I will talk about, and also <laughs> knowing that they can just trust their doctor. The more you can trust, the greater the therapeutic alliance, the greater you can help guide someone out of a bad trip if they fall into a K-hole or somewhere else, for example. So how does this have to, what does this have to do with healing medical trauma? Well, first and foremost, we know that psychedelics, like MDMA in particular, is the classic empathogen, meaning that you feel empathy for other people. This is really important. So don't forget the concept of empathy, because it's, by definition, putting yourself out of your sense of self and putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Very important, especially when people talk about ego dissolution, 
and other levels of a psychedelic experience. So keeping that in mind, we also know that LSD, another psychedelic, does have strong dopamine effects like the other anesthetics that we talked about, but also can downregulate the amygdala so that when you show people scary photos or people with unfriendly faces, their amygdala does not light up in the same way. Where are we going with this? You'll see. And we also know that the effects of a psychedelic experience, even though they're often serotonergic in nature, can outlast the duration that they're active in the brain. So like when someone's in the operating room having anesthesia, for days, weeks, months, years after the anesthesia is out of their brain, they might still be suffering from PTSD. <laughs> Almost dropped the propofol. From PTSD, from post-operative depression. But the same goes for healing. If we heal, if we focus on healing during such an experience, the benefits might outlast through neuroplasticity or other as of yet determined mechanisms, might long outlast the duration that um, the, the duration of action of the mechanisms in the, of the drugs in the brain itself. Not so for SSRIs typically, where when we discontinue Zoloft or Lexapro or other types of antidepressants, there may even be a rebound effect or like a pseudo withdrawal. So fundamentally different. Now, overstimulation brings this all together because when we, <laughs> unfortunately, when patients come to me, they have been, hey, Rebecca, hey, Chrissy, good to see you. When patients come to me, especially in surgery, they have been so overstimulated often, fears of anesthesia, fear of surgery, that their dopamine system is on turbo mode. Whether it's from you search for surgery online, maybe you see my website, maybe you see other websites, but these ads and these search engines are designed to serve you what you want. So you get a little dopamine rush every time. Often patients are using drugs, like I said, SSRIs, like Zoloft, stimulants, like Ritalin, or um, there's so many medications that might provide a little bit of dopamine interaction as well long before they come to me. Maybe they're self-medicating with other medications before they come in the operating room, which happens very often. There is this whole culture that patients come to me with, with the severe FOMO, you know, fear of missing out, which is perfectly poised to have people feel inadequate unless they, gee, I don't know, buy something, uh, book a vacation, ultimately spending money. And I'm not saying that money is bad or that money can't provide some levels of pleasure, but pleasure and happiness aren't the same thing. They're not the same level of sustainability or durability. And unfortunately, many patients get stuck in this overstimulation cycle where dopamine is constantly being hammered and they get a withdrawal from not getting that dopamine and boom, they're back on the Amazon app ordering more or um, being served up more ads and almost like a gambling addiction or a sex addiction or any other type of addiction, the root cause of what they're searching for isn't there. Notice this is the opposite of expansive consciousness states, like we said for LSD, where it's an empathogen. You're not worrying about your FOMO, you're thinking about other people. It's different than, <laughs> um, when we're talking about LSD lowering our fear response, so it's literally not fear of missing out because your amygdala is being turned off. It's less responsive, so that fear of missing out isn't so much fearful anymore. It's a fundamentally different experience. Same goes for ketamine and so many other, and by the way, not just substances, but even spiritual or religious experiences. All humans have probably some capacity to be able to experience altered states of consciousness where they're not subjected to dopamine overstimulation, the limbic system gone awry, or being a slave ultimately to hedonistic pleasures and dopamine being boom, 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 um, which is closely related to the addictions that we talked about earlier. It's not just addiction to fentanyl like I have here. It can be addiction to, like we said, sex, gambling, shopping, etc. So what is the solution to this vicious cycle that patients often find themselves in when they come to me, either for surgery or for a psychedelic experience? The beauty is in the elegance of the simplicity that it's about how can we reset? How can we reset this dopamine overstimulation? How can we realign our purpose in life, our meaning, our values in a way that help us not be a slave to dopamine, but to be able to use dopamine in ways for goal-oriented behaviors? 
it's like pleasure versus recreation, if you will, or many ways of just doing things for pleasure versus doing things in a goal-oriented, recreational, fun way. I'm not saying recreational drugs, I'm saying recreational, goal-oriented behaviors. Learning. Curiosity underlies so much of this process, which can be a side effect or a byproduct of having a medically supervised, compassionately guided experience, either in surgery, no matter how stressful it might be up front, or through a psychedelic experience. And there's so many of them, and they're not all legal in the United States, and I'm not condoning anything that's illegal, but like I said, ketamine is what I have the most experience with in guiding patients, IV ketamine, which is legal when used um, with the appropriate <laughs> medical supervision. So when patients come, and this is the crux, this is what you, what you all need to do here. Often patients have just not had the ability to advocate for themselves. In our US healthcare system, I'm going to be uh, perfectly honest and say that it's not designed really for a healthcare system. It's more of a sick care system. It doesn't help patients be empowered or advocate for themselves. And you can see how they can fall into this vicious cycle of not being empowered to ultimately tap into their inner healing potential. The pill mill approach doesn't give patients the empowerment that they need. 